If you do things that the state will find helpful, whether it's cooperating with the Russian intelligence agencies abroad, smuggling in the right kind of goods, then you will get a certain degree of a blind eye being turned to your other activities. Now, we do know, for example, that there are human trafficking gangs, which usually the state actually was, was, was quite tough on. But nonetheless, being allowed to smuggle humans out of Russia, or usually through Russia, pretty much freely, certainly through the Russian border control points, because the same gangs bring back microchips or other components. So this is it's now very much it's about deals. The state is still dominant, but on the other hand, you know, it has to actually treat the organized crime gangs as interlocutors with whom it has to make transactions rather than just simply giving them orders. Welcome to Deep Dive from the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime. I'm Jack Megan Vickers. And this is Russia, war, and organized crime. In 1991, when the Soviet Union disintegrated, Russia, like a number of independent states that emerged, was gripped by uncertainty, violence, and crime. Car bombs, shootings, unchecked criminal power, underpaid and overwhelmed law enforcement. Contract killings were a standard business practice. This anarchy was said to have left a scar on the Russian psyche, a reminder of what can happen when the state essentially fails and chaos reigns. The collapse of the Soviet Union at the end of 1991 led to this period known as the Wild 90s, a decade of, frankly, near-state collapse. And in particular, this was a time when everything was up for grabs. This is Mark Galliotti, the executive director of Mayak Intelligence, Honorary Professor at University College London and a member of the GI Network of Experts. And he's also the author of The Vori, Russia's Super Mafia, and a paper for the GI called Time of Troubles, The Russian Underworld Since the Ukraine Invasion. On the one hand, you had the oligarchs stealing on an industrial scale, but you also had organised crime really exploding almost quite literally in the sense of this was a time when pecking orders were being established, turf borders being drawn. And it was almost a daily event in cities like Moscow that you'd have a shooting here, a car bombing there. And so it was a real period of serious violence, out of which the new underworld order and the relationship with the state emerged. By the end of the 1990s, broadly speaking, the turf had been delineated, the pecking orders established, and organized crime was essentially rooted solidly within the economy. Within Russia, the stabilisation of the state at the end of the 90s has been largely credited to Vladimir Putin. Of course, whether that is fully true or not is not hugely important because, like politicians all over the world, the credit given has been used to justify the wider regime. One thing that is most certainly true is that the wild 90s was a period of unprecedented violence. New gangs emerged from the sports clubs of Moscow and St. Petersburg, comprised of wrestlers and weightlifters with nicknames like Sledgehammer and Flatiron. Contract killings were consistently high throughout the decade. Andrea Konstantinov, a crime journalist during this period, told Radio Free Europe in 2015 that in St. Petersburg, the birthplace of the crime group Tambovskaya, 6,000 people were killed during the decade. In that same interview, he said that it was simply a way of doing business and very effective. And in principle, it was inexpensive. This was the same city Putin cut his political teeth during the same decade, and the violence even stretched into the start of his presidency, which began in 1999. There were at least 500 known assassinations, although the likely number was two or three times higher. Crime also strayed into the chaotic business sector. Remember, this was a period that saw the rise of the so-called oligarchs, a tiny number of people who made an exorbitant amount of money. For example, there was the so-called aluminium wars that plagued the metal industries. The former Chelsea football club owner Roman Abramovich once told a court in London that every three days, someone was being murdered. Sergei Goncharov, a former head of an elite KGB unit in 1997, speaking to the Washington Post at the time, described Russia as having four powers, legislative, executive, judicial, and the mass media. But he added that there was also a fifth, bandits. He said that 
In Russia, it seems the power of bandits is somewhere close to first, second or third. I think it's hard to understand the anarchy of this period and how the memories of it linger. It's really a period that has been not only thoroughly mythologised, but I think also become quite a scarring and politically as well as culturally important era. You've got to realise the 1990s was a truly miserable time for most Russians. As someone who you know, travelled there quite often, it was quite extraordinary because on the one hand, this was the era where all of a sudden dark city streets suddenly became emblazoned with neon and adverts and such like. And there's modern Western cars in the streets. It's worth noting that through the 1990s, Mercedes sold more armoured limousines in Russia than in the rest of the world put together. So while 0.0 whatever percent of the Russian population were, were making huge amounts of money, the overwhelming majority were incredibly impoverished. This is a time when you would see lines of pensioners outside metro stations selling anything they possibly had because their pensions were now essentially worthless. You know, a half-used tube of toothpaste I once saw. And in that context, I mean, the, the violence of the gangs was one which was largely unconstrained by the need to be careful about bystanders because the police were, were outgunned, underpaid and demoralized. And so on the one hand, it's created this real genuine fear of anarchy on the streets. And it's something that Vladimir Putin has been able to mobilize as the man who brought back order to Russia. And whatever else they may feel, that is something that many Russians, especially those who lived through the 1990s, still give him credit for. We'll come back to the mythologizing of this criminal period later, because that has led to some really interesting developments. A good example of the chaos of the 90s can be told through a brief story about a man called Alexander the Great, or Superkiller. His real name was Alexander Solonik. Now, this guy was almost a myth in his own lifetime. A former soldier who became a riot police officer, but also a contract killer. He was said to have fought his way out of a police station in 1994, killing seven officers in the process. He once escaped from a prison. Apparently a gifted shot, Solonik's specialism was killing heavily protected gangsters. And so during the 90s, his services were sought after. He was later killed in Greece in 1997. Another story related to a guy called Vasily Naumov, the leader of a Moscow gang was gunned down in his BMW outside of a police station, also in 1997. But what's really interesting about his assassination was that Naumov's bodyguards, who failed to protect him, were members of Saturn, an elite police unit. But there were others, law enforcement that became organised crime. And that's where the term werewolves in uniforms came from. It's a very distinctive Russian term that emerged, and again, it's really a product of the 1990s, that essentially organised crime groups which are entirely made up of people within the law enforcement and security apparatus. So we're not just talking about the odd bad apple who may happen to be you know, doing some kind of corrupt deal with gangsters. It's actually an organised crime network inside the police or the security apparatus. And they were very much a feature of the 1990s, and to a large extent had pretty much disappeared through the, the later noughts and, and, and into the teens and are unfortunately again beginning to recur in Russia today. And so let me give you an example. Recently, three members of Directorate M, the Russian Federal Security Service, the FSB's anti-corruption unit, were arrested on charges that they accepted 5 billion rubles in bribes. That's about $55 million dollars. It's alleged that they were investigating a well-known company in Russia and attempted to extort the company in exchange for dropping the investigation. And this is not an isolated case. Three police officers in Sochi were convicted of fraud at the end of 2023. Indeed, two significant arrests in December last year saw the two leaders of the so-called werewolves captured by law enforcement. An article surrounding their arrests talks about the wild 90s and the role of murdering and kidnapping. So why has there been a re-emergence of werewolves in uniform? From the point of view of people within the security apparatus, actually a lot of them have, although their salaries have notionally gone up, they have found the quality of their life diminishing because prices have gone up even greater. And there is a general sense of I suppose, a lack of strength at the helm, that at the moment the government is just so preoccupied with the war in Ukraine that in some ways that is all that matters. And so there is both a push and an opportunity for the, these gangsters within the security apparatus, who at the moment pretty much feel metaphorically bulletproof. 
And so, you know, we have seen, you know, a lot more groups. Indeed, I mean, I, I say this just literally in the last couple of days, you know, re recording this, there's been a new account of a gang within the FSB, the Federal Security Service, which is the main internal security agency, a kind of FBI on steroids, that elements within there were actually supplying drugs to paratroopers who are involved in, in the front line. So we are seeing a, a increasing tempo of accounts of these kind of gangs. And unfortunately, for the foreseeable future, I think they're just going to get more and more common. Corruption is a major concern in Russia. According to Transparency International's Corruption Perception Index, Russia sits 141st out of 180 countries. Indeed, like Ukraine, corruption has hindered Russia's war effort. In early 2023, a Russian colonel called Alexander Denisov was arrested after being accused of stealing seven V92S2 engines from T20 battle tanks. Each engine is thought to be worth around 20.5 million rubles. That's around $200,000. Denisov pled not guilty. An engine theft like this is usually highly targeted, out of practicality as much as anything else, because in the case of these T20 battle tank engines, they weigh around a ton each. Now, in the lead up to this war, and even prior to it, access to specific dual-use technologies can be highly prized. I came across this tweet from Anton Herachenko, an advisor to the Ukrainian government, and it was from back in October 2022. And the tweet said, Iranian Mahaja 6 drone shot down over Black Sea in October had engines made by Rotax company. And it was accompanied by some pictures of a downed drone in Ukraine. They clearly showed an engine with a Rotax logo. Now these engines are only made in Austria. And it turned out that before the full-scale invasion, there had been a number of thefts reported across Europe from the UK to Norway and Germany. Thought to be stolen to order, organized criminals located relatively new Rotax 912 engines inside light aircraft. These were then carefully removed and smuggled out of the country. Two Iranian-made drones, the Mahaja 6 and the Shahid drones, appear to use Rotax engines, although Rotax claims that these engines must have been stolen or are counterfeits. And Iran claims that their defense industries has reached self-sufficiency in designing and making heavy engines. Now, we don't know for sure who was behind these thefts across Europe. And forgive me for sounding like an advert for Russian organized crime. But we do know that some of the larger criminal networks from Russia can cover whatever your criminal needs are. Look, Russian organized crime has been one of the most extraordinary beneficiaries, frankly, of globalization. In the 1990s, they particularly crashed out into Central Europe with an aim of trying to become, almost, shall we say, criminal overlords. That failed. Frankly, that's not how mafias operate. So instead, in the last 20 years, they have emerged largely as criminal facilitators not trying to compete with local gangs, but instead trying to offer them services. You know, what do you need? Do you need drugs? Do you need women? Do you need guns? Do you need computer hackers? Whatever you want, we are in some ways the one-stop shop who can provide it. And so actually they have an extraordinary network in Europe and beyond. And that network can be put to all kinds of different uses, depending on what the particular economic opportunities at the time are. Now, this is really interesting because one thing that organized crime can do is smuggle things in. And so the heavy sanctions that Russia's been under is the perfect opportunity for people with those types of skills to help in exchange for turning a blind eye for maybe some illicit drugs coming into the country. As the Russian state deals with sanctions, particularly sanctions that affect things like the microchips that they need for the guidance systems in their missiles and drones, there is a clear desire to, to basically get them and a willingness to both pay for it and also turn a blind eye to whatever means are used. And so although most of these sanctioned goods are not coming through organized crime routes, but other types of shadowy facilitators, it is clear that we're seeing front companies being set up in order to buy goods that can then be smuggled into Russia, largely through Belarus. We're seeing thefts of items that can then be stripped for their microchips or other components. There was even talk about speed cameras in Sweden being stolen so that their optics could be used in drones. Now, the Swedish government has since denied this. But to be honest, I've had from several sources within the Swedish police claims that, in fact, no, it really did happen. So essentially, anything that the Russian defense industrial complex needs gangsters can find a ready market for, and whether they do it themselves or whether they work with locals, remember, through their networks, they are clearly in, in the business of providing whatever the goods the Kremlin needs. According to the US government's commerce control list, there are 81 unique components found in Russian weapon systems that are considered dual use. 
These components already had controls placed on them after the annexation of Crimea in 2014. And yet, back in 2022, it was reported that there had been a surge in the suspected smuggling of white goods, like fridges or washing machines, and even breast pumps into Russia, for those microchips to be ripped out and repurposed for military equipment. After the full-scale invasion, it was reported that pro-Russian organised criminals from Ukraine dispersed across Europe. In Finland, a small gang is allegedly making €35,000 a month stealing catalytic converters from cars. GPS technology has also been targeted because of its importance to military equipment like unmanned aerial vehicles, for example, drones. In the UK, there was a series of burglaries across rural communities in early 2023. These targeted thefts were after expensive GPS units from farm machinery. The finger was pointed at domestic and international organised crime. According to the National Rural Crime Unit, most of the stolen units were going abroad. Speaking to the news website Politico, Superintendent Andrew Huddleston, who leads the UK's National Rural Crime Unit, said that it's heading to Eastern Europe, without a doubt. And the destination is reportedly Russia. Due to heavy sanctions, companies like John Deere, Massey Ferguson and others have all withdrawn from the Russian market. That creates a field of opportunity and fertile ground for organised crime to grow. Indeed, after the full-scale invasion began two years ago, Russia took the Ukrainian city of Molitopol in the Zaporizhia Oblast. Here they found a John Deere dealership and stole nearly $5 million worth of farm vehicles, shipping them out of the country. Unfortunately for the thieves, these vehicles were remotely locked, which means, as they are, they won't move. Now, who facilitated these various examples of technology theft is unclear. But as we heard earlier, Russian organised crime has a diverse portfolio of criminal pursuits. So if your organisation is able to smuggle in stolen GPS units, engines or dual-use microchips, perhaps the state will look the other way when you smuggle in, say, drugs. There's this wonderful Russian word, panyatia, understandings, that really from the very beginning of the Putin era, the Kremlin made it clear what it was and what it was not willing to accept. And if you broke the rules, it would come down on you hard. If you observed the rules, well, the police might still try to catch you, but essentially you would be allowed to continue your operations. What has changed is that originally this was about proscription, saying the things that you can't do which basically meant anything that was a challenge or a threat to the state. Increasingly now, as Russia really has moved into a wartime footing, even before 2022, instead we're seeing prescription. In other words, the state saying, this is what we'd like you to do. And if you do this, you will gain benefits. So what we see is this very pragmatic relationship. If you do things that the state will find helpful, whether it's cooperating with the Russian intelligence agencies abroad, smuggling in the right kind of goods, then you will get a certain degree of a blind eye being turned to your other activities. Now, we do know, for example, that there are human trafficking gangs, which usually the state actually was, was, was quite tough on. But nonetheless, being allowed to smuggle humans out of Russia, or usually through Russia, pretty much freely, certainly through the Russian border control points, because the same gangs bring back microchips or other components. So this is it's now very much it's about deals. The state is still dominant, but on the other hand, you know, it has to actually treat the organized crime gangs as interlocutors with whom it has to make transactions rather than just simply giving them orders. And sanctions have caused other knock-on effects, namely the actual flow of illicit goods, and consequently the criminal landscape has been evolving along with it. Well, it's interesting because clearly because the, the smuggling routes have changed and the smuggling commodities to a degree have changed, what we tend to find are gangs which are often previously in what would be considered backwaters, you know, groups for which, for example, are along the Belarusian border or groups which have strong connections with Armenia, Azerbaijan and Georgia in the South Caucasus, which they can use for smuggling. You know, they're suddenly getting much more important and, you know, money breeds power. Money also breeds the potential for rivals wanting to muscle in on your on your territory. The thing is, really, the, the most beneficial opportunities are for those gangs which can't be muscled out. And in particular, we are seeing this a lot in the, the case of Central Asia, where you know Central Asia has now increasingly, particularly I would say Kazakhstan, becoming a, a turntable 
for all kinds of goods being smuggled in and out of Russia, whether it's actually microchips or whether it's trucks that can be used for military logistics, or even if it's, for example, modern smart fridges, which after all have a lot of internal microchips that can then be yanked out and repurposed for other rather more lethal systems. A lot of that comes through Central Asia. This shift is also evident in the illicit drug flows. The GI produced a report called Crossroads, Kazakhstan's Changing Illicit Drug Economy. Interviews with Kazakh law enforcement revealed that on the outbreak of the full-scale conflict, some Russian nationals, including possible members of drug trafficking organizations, emigrated to the Central Asian country, possibly to avoid mobilization. Indeed, in that same report, it was revealed that most of the large-scale clandestine laboratories in Kazakhstan have been set up by Russian nationals. One such synthetic drug lab was producing Alpha PVP. We covered this drug during a previous episode, which I'll link to in the podcast notes. 200 kilograms of finished product were found, ready for distribution to the CIS countries, but also another 15 tonnes of precursor chemicals. Since February 2022, the number of large-scale synthetic drug laboratories has risen, and the manufacturing of these drugs has increased exponentially as a result. One such transnational criminal group, heavily involved in the synthetic drug trade, and we now know are operating in Kazakhstan, is Himprom. You might remember that we discussed them in a previous episode on drug use on the front line. They're also operating in Belarus, Georgia, Ukraine and Russia. But what is really interesting is that those Russian organised criminals are no longer operating on their turf, but in a foreign country. Whereas a few years ago, ethnic Russian gangs largely had the whip hand. Local gangs in Central Asia wanted to deal with them and often had to put up with a lot of rubbish and a lot of racist stereotyping. Well, now it's the other way around. Now it's that the Russians are coming to try and deal with the Central Asians and they have to be much, much more polite much, much more respectful of the Central Asian's interests. And so there is a clear shift in the balance of power. But those gangs, which in a way bridge the gap, which include Russians and Kazakhs or Kyrgyz or Turkmen or whatever, they are the ones who are really strong. You can come in and you can say, give us some tribute from your trade. But if you're an entirely ethnic Russian gang, you can't expect to walk into somewhere like, say, Uzbekistan and start to lay down the law because you're going to be dealing with gangs that actually have strong local connections with the authorities and can use, frankly, the police to push you out. So again, this is what's happening. It's all the old certainties, all the old distinctions of you know what would make a gang weak or strong are now being upended. And that is why this is a very turbulent and potentially dangerous time in Russia in terms of its organised crime situation. And the situation has directly impacted the older, bigger and more powerful, truly transnational criminal organisations based in Moscow and St. Petersburg. Ukraine was just so crucial to the economic ecologies, shall we say, of the biggest criminal networks. Because you know, groups like Sansova and Tambovskaya, we, we might call them criminal gangs, but really they had become international criminal networks. Constellations of a whole variety of smaller and often local groupings, all of whom worked together precisely because there was not just greater security in doing so, but also greater profits. And almost invariably, a key element of that economy was the capacity to smuggle goods through Ukraine. And one way or the other, directly or indirectly, that tended to also always focus on counterfeit goods and most of all drugs. And therefore, they essentially monopolized, or tried to anyway, monopolize this business because it was the most lucrative, it was the safest, it was a, a bulk industry. So obviously you don't want to let smaller operators involved. But actually for, for, for the big ones, often Ukraine was absolutely central and it's suddenly been lost. And so they have really taken a biggest hit from that. If we take Saltseva, which is the, the most well-known one, and also in many ways the most diffuse, it has become so successful that in some ways it was no longer really a criminal organisation. There was no one person or even a kind of ruling council running it. But nonetheless, you know, it is the one that we see operating across Europe, in North America. It's got connections in Latin America involved in, for example, moving cocaine into through Russia and, and so forth. The fact that all of a sudden a central part of its business model has been blown out from under it is clearly causing problems. And it's what, what it's leading to are three particular processes. One is elements which were part of Saltseva thinking, well, I don't need to anymore because there's nothing they can offer me. If you look at, for example, what was Saltseva's operations in Spain, they're pretty much autonomous now. Secondly, you have desperate attempts to move into new businesses. 
which tends to mean by displacing others. So again, it's another force for turf wars and such like. And thirdly, the capacity to basically buy protection, courtesy of your massive profits, has now been undermined. So the people in Sonsova who up to this point were pretty much untouchable now are very much touchable. And we're already beginning to see people within the police, the judiciary, the investigative agencies who, you know, there, there, there are still good, honest Russian officers, you know, are now actually looking at Sonsova in a way that they didn't bother before. Because I remember just from, from speaking to Russian investigators myself when I was still able to travel there, you know, they said, look, there's no point. We could spend three years building a case and then we'd get a phone call from someone with a lot more gold on their epaulets telling us to drop it. So they didn't even bother. Well, now they're bothering. You can't underestimate how interconnected the Ukrainian and Russian organised criminal groups were prior to February 2022. Even after the annexation of Crimea in 2014 and the Russian-backed separatists in the east of Ukraine, an insurrection which heavily involved organised criminals, Ukrainian and pro-Russian criminal groups still found a way to work together. Drugs, people and even weapons were trafficked over the front line between Ukrainian forces and the separatists. Odessa, the vitally important port city on the Black Sea, was the main entry point for cocaine from Latin America, precursor chemicals for synthetics from China, heroin travelling on the northern route out of Afghanistan and through Central Asia and then into Russia, would then travel through Ukraine and on to Western Europe. But after the full-scale invasion began, a schism truly formed between pro-Russian and pro-Ukrainian organised crime groups. Indeed, a GTOC investigation into Odessa revealed that pro-Ukrainian criminals had adopted a hyper-patriotic stance. A great example of this was a vor called Serhii Lazenko, a high-ranking and respected criminal in Odessa. According to sources in the city, before the war he was known to work with Russians, but adopted a pro-Ukrainian stance after the invasion began. Those criminals who remained pro-Russian left Odessa shortly after the invasion began after discussions with the Ukrainian SBU and police. It was also reported that Ukrainian authorities warned criminals to break all communication with the Russian Mafia. The instability and potential volatility within Russian organised crime is not just the changing illicit flows or criminal groups, it's also evident in the individual organised criminals themselves. To understand this, we need to go back to an incident we've talked about before on this podcast. So last year we did an episode on the Wagner Group. Remember that video of Yevgeny Prigozhin, the then leader of Wagner, standing in a prison encouraging inmates to sign up for the private military contractor to fight in Ukraine. Now since that time, unless you've been living under a rock, you'll know that the person driving that recruitment, Yevgeny Prigozhin, is... No more. In the last hour, it's been confirmed that Yevgeny Prigozhin, head of the Wagner Group, was on board the private jet that crashed near Moscow. But it makes sense to briefly look at how that recruitment started and what happened to those who signed up. Initial reports indicated that recruitment was fairly limited, and it was only after a statement from an infamous criminal that was broadcast across prison television straight after President Putin's New Year address that things changed. Shachar Maladoy, also sort of his actual name is Zakhar Kalashov, one of the, the last of the old school Vori Vazakonya in many ways. I mean, actually, one who had managed to find a peace with the new age of the Avtoriceti, which is quite unusual. So in other words, he's still alive. And he has been something of a fixture within the Russian underworld. He is one of the most high profile and best known figures within it. He has survived because he's managed to also find his peace with the authorities. And this became particularly striking when towards the end of 2022, we had the first start of the recruitment of prisoners from the Russian labor camp system to fight in Ukraine, initially by the Wagner mercenary. And this was very, very controversial. There was a fair number of criminals, often kind of low-level thugs type, who were perfectly willing to accept and go and fight for six months in return for a pardon. 
But there were others who thought that this seemed morally reprehensible, not because they had a problem with fighting in Ukraine, but because they had a problem with fighting for the government. There's still an, an element of the old sort of war code. And this is why it became so significant when Shahro Maladoy came out in this broadcast, which was then retransmitted within the prison system. So in other words, it was clearly done with the collusion and the approval of the authorities, in which he actually said that in his view, Speaking as, as I said, the probably the the last of the real old beasts of the Vori Zakonia. He does have a kind of a moral authority in that respect. Anyway, in his view, it was entirely legitimate because it shouldn't be thought of as working for the authorities, but instead should be thought of as working for your own personal freedom, so you can get get back out there unspoken is and then carry on your crimes. Unfortunately for the prisoners, this recruitment drive took place when Wagner PMC was locked in a fierce attritional battle over the city of Bakhmut. Many of these now former prisoners were killed in one of the so-called meat waves, and some of them were well-known figures in Russian organised crime. And there are concerns about the vacuum left behind. Yes, this is going to be one of the interesting unforeseen circumstances, I think, from the, the state's point of view, because it actually is likely to have a further destabilizing effect on the underworld, which is one of the general sort of themes of my report. But in this case, particularly, we haven't seen the really serious figures you know, right at the top of the system joining the military. Why would they? Because they're all too well protected. Even if they're in prison, they're still running their gangs. One, a particularly notorious figure, a Georgian by the name of Tariel Onyani, actually ran his gang by Skype from his prison cell. These are not the people who, who need to take the, the Kremlin shilling. And although most of the people who fought and indeed died in Ukraine, I mean, whether they did much for the war effort, but certainly this, this whole program did a lot for reducing prison overcrowding in Russia, they may not matter. But that middle layer the sort of fairly significant, often regional criminal gang bosses who have fought and have died. Well, obviously, their gangs are not going to fall apart. But what tends to happen when you have a sudden and unexpected decapitation is often there is no clear line of succession. You then have struggles as to who is going to take over. And the possibility of gang wars, which is something that the Kremlin is really worried about, it does not want its home front being ripped by a new series of gang wars while it's busy fighting a war in Ukraine. But that prospect has become much more likely. And we have seen some suggestions, particularly in the North Caucasus, but also in some other parts of southern Russia, of deaths of leaders in the war actually leading to trouble on the streets. Those that signed up and survived were given amnesty for previous crimes after six months of service, and they were free to return to Russia. So what happened to them? Well... We know a number of those that have been released after service have returned to reoffending from drugs to bar fights. But more seriously has been the pardoning of convicted murderers, some of which have gone on to murder again. Indeed, according to a local news outlet, a specific community in Kirov Oblast called a meeting with local leaders to express concerns about returning soldiers, who were also pardoned ex-prisoners after one had been seen walking the streets armed with an axe. He was arrested days later for murder. And of course, those returning from war can be significantly traumatised, perhaps brutalised. Back in 2015, fighters armed with illegally smuggled weapons returned to Russia from the breakaway regions of Donetsk and Luhansk, and it caused a significant uptick in violent crime. The Rostov region, just over the border from Ukraine, saw an increase of 23.4%. Even Moscow at the time saw an uptick in gang-related violence thought to be linked to this flow of weapons and men. It's reported that around 150,000 inmates had been granted amnesty in exchange for military service, and recruitment within the prison system appears to be still going on. It was reported in the Times recently that prison authorities had been accused of turning off the heating in prisons, trying to make life so uncomfortable for prisoners that they'd prefer to fight in Ukraine, this time for the Russian military's Storm Z units rather than Wagner PMC. But that pressure from Russian citizens to protect their communities from those who return and begin reoffending has possibly worked, because reports from February this year say that the six-month service for amnesty has been scrapped and now prisoners must serve until the end of the war and will no longer be pardoned. If we look back at the history of organised crime in Russia, you often hear about the Vori Zagonia, thieves in law. They have a long history in the criminal landscape of the country. Indeed, as Mark said earlier, Zakhar Kalashov, otherwise known as Shakro the Younger, 
the influential criminal who beamed his message of encouragement across Russian prisons, urging inmates to join Wagner, he is a vor. And I imagine when you think about Russian organised crime, you probably think of a vor, a guy covered in elaborate tattoos, each with different meanings, who follows a criminal code and are incredibly violent. Think Viggo Mortensen's character in the film Eastern Promises by David Cronenberg. We think he might be Russian Mafia. And he was a member of Vorev Sakonia. In Russian prisons, your life story is written on your body. And tattoos. If you don't have tattoos, you don't exist. Within 21st century Russia, the Vori are no longer the force they once were. Thieves in law still command nostalgic respect from their criminal peers. But those who control Russian organised crime today are known as Avtoritet, and Shakro is one of those too. Essentially, an avtoritet is an authority, and it's a term that emerged really as part of the evolution of Russian organized crimes culture. What we saw through the 1980s and into the 1990s is really that the Vori were increasingly dinosaurs. And in a new age where the state was falling apart, business was being legalized and so forth, you had a new generation of criminal kingpins emerging who became known as the Aptoriteti, the authorities. And these were basically criminal businessmen. And they almost invariably are men. These are people who, you know, yes, they would carry out what we would think of as conventional organized crime activities, trafficking in drugs, protection, racketeering, and the like, but they also had no problem operating entirely legitimately or in the gray area in between. They didn't really care if they broke the law or not. They were just in it to make money as effectively as possible and as safely as possible, and they would do whatever that was. And this is really the new kind of criminal kingpin who dominates in Russia. They are essentially, obviously rather, amoral, self-interested, not motivated by any kind of traditional code. They are just simply out to do whatever they need to do to get power and money and keep it. Now, although the Avtoritet control large swathes of the Russian criminal economy, the Vori have left their mark through language, the image of a Vor, essentially culturally. It's like when you think of the Italian-American La Cosa Nostra, you think of Lucky Luciano, Al Capone, Paul Castellano or John Gotti. Because these people, for better or worse, have become mythologized. Films, books, TV series, countless documentaries. In Russia, it's the Voris of Gonya who are mythologized, inspiring a youth prison subculture known as the AUE. It's actually a youth gang phenomenon. So in other words, what we've got are teenagers trying to emulate something that happened before they were born. So it's a lot of it is very much mythologized and it's sort of drawn from what they've seen on TV and in film and, and so forth. They very much harken back to the era where kind of the idea was your real criminal life w was in the prison camp system. But why this is particularly interesting, I mean, AUE... There's even debate about quite what the acronym means, probably something like sort of uh, uh, prison criminal unity. But as members of AUE begin to get older, most of them, like as in, in most youth gangs around the world, they grow up and they grow out. They either end up in prison or they get a job or they get married or whatever, and they, and they leave their old gang ties behind. The ones who don't, though, in some ways are the ones who begin to turn pretty incohate youth gangs into more organized criminal structures. And this is where we are at the moment. There is an uncertainty as to whether AUE is on the cusp of a kind of maturation, turning from just a whole collection of criminal youth gangs, moving beyond that into actually organised crime operations and beginning to see them being more ambitious, more organised, more large scale in their activities. But again, it says something about the current turbulence within Russian organised crime, the Russian underworld, that there are the spaces for these youth gangs to begin to become citywide criminal phenomena. The AUE was labelled an extremist organisation in Russia back in 2020. According to court documents, the AUE are estimated to have 34,000 members, 40% of which are teenagers, some as young as 13. There was an interesting case recently in Russia relating to the AUE, and it involved a child doll. A Russian artist was filmed covering the doll with criminal tattoos, including an eight-pointed star, deemed to be a symbol of the AUE. The artist was fined 1,000 rubles, which is around $10, and ordered to destroy the doll. <laughs> Finally, there is another example from recent history that could be indicative of an uncertain and potentially volatile future for Russian organised crime. Back in 1979, the Soviet Union invaded Afghanistan. 
But like before and since, the country lived up to its reputation as the Graveyard of Empires. What was expected to be a short military campaign for the Red Army instead lasted 10 years, ending with a withdrawal of Soviet troops in 1989, at the same time the USSR had begun to disintegrate. The Soviet Union suffered 15,000 casualties during this conflict, and it was largely seen as a failure. But what is less discussed is the impact returning soldiers had on the rise of organised crime in the country. Yes, the interesting thing about that terrible war was precisely that it coincided with, anyway, the creeping collapse of the Soviet Union, driven in part, frankly, by the attempts to reform it by Mikhail Gorbachev. And what that meant was that a lot of these soldiers came back, and about overall, about about one million Soviet, largely men, but also some women, went through Afghanistan as soldiers or as civilian contractors and the like. So they came back and they were being scapegoated for having been involved in an unsuccessful war. It's a depressing truth across the world that if, if you fight in a war that the population regards as a failure, you will be blamed for it. So what happened was you suddenly had this influx of battle-scarred, combat trained, thoroughly disillusioned people, most just adapted back to life, but you know, a certain proportion of these people who were a perfect source of muscle at the very time that organized crime was emerging and becoming more more dominant. And that, I think I would say, kind of turbocharged the process. Because there's not actually the Afghansi on the whole formed criminal gangs themselves. Some did. But mainly it was that they became a new source of what in Russian criminal slang are called bulls or torpedoes, enforcers or hitmen for the gangs. And that made the conflicts that were inevitable that much more violent, that much more widespread, but also that much more competent and professional because these people have been trained in the use of violence. Fast forward to today. Russia is now two years into the full scale invasion of Ukraine. And it's been so much bloodier for Russia than the Soviet war in Afghanistan. One day, this war will end, and hundreds of thousands of soldiers will return home. So could we see a similar rise in criminality and organised crime when that happens? I mean, in some ways, I'll, I'll give you three scenarios. The one which is, in some ways, the most benign, but also you know, deeply worrying one, is that the state manages to just about maintain its grip on what happens in, in the underworld. Yes, it'll be that much weaker. There will be a rolling back of a lot of the progress, which we've got to be honest, had been made in the earlier Putin years, though I would say despite rather than thanks to Putin. But nonetheless, it has been made. In due course, after the war, we will probably see a reconnection of the Russian and Ukrainian criminal gangs, simply because there's just too much money to be made of it, regardless of the bad blood. Same way as we've also seen that Russian gangs and Chechen gangs continue to cooperate even after the brutal war, two wars that were fought in against Chechnya. So in some ways, the best case scenario is what we're seeing now, but a bit more so. A bit more violent, a bit more rough and ready, a bit more able to ignore the state, but essentially sort of similar. That is, I would say, as I said, the best case scenario, and I suspect it will prove too optimistic a scenario. The other two, one is the nightmare scenario of the so-called sort of Donbassization. The, the Donbass regions of the Donetsk and Lugansk People's Republics, quote unquote, which are now sort of annexed to Russia, essentially had become criminalized pseudo-states that were kept afloat through institutionalized criminal activity. And what we could see is essentially the same kind of anarchy becoming much more of a feature in Russia, not just because the state becomes much, much weaker, but also because local economies become more and more dependent upon precisely some kind of criminal activities of, it, of any sort, whether it's embezzlement, whether it's smuggling or whatever. So essentially something of a return to the wild 90s as a result of the sort of debilitating impact of this ghastly war in Ukraine. The third scenario is as we see the state state, which for a long time has had its relationship with organised crime, but increasingly regarding it as a vital element of its state craft, because we're already seeing it abroad, not just involved in smuggling, but everything from assassinations to gathering intelligence in support of the Russian intelligence services and so forth. It may well reach the point where the government thinks, look, all these various ad hoc deals, they're all very well, but they're just not enough. And you mentioned the example of North Korea, where, where Bureau 39 is in some ways its ministry of organized crime that does everything from carrying out insurance frauds and computer hacks to earn money for this bankrupt state to basically using criminals as intelligence assets 
I think that's what we might well see. We might well see actually an increasing nationalization of the underworld. Not of every aspect. There's still going to be the protection racketeers and the drug peddlers on the streets and so forth. We're not going to see that come under state control. But the higher level functions and particularly the transnational dimensions of Russian criminality will increasingly be forced under state control. We've seen this, for example, with the mercenary realm, where we still see sort of Wagner and other mercenaries operating in Africa, for example. But increasingly, they have so-called curators. In other words, military intelligence officers who are really there to actually control them. Commissars, it would be back in the old Soviet times. Well, that's how it may well be with the underworld. We may may well see increasingly a use of gangsters turning into an incorporation of gangsters into the covert structures of the state. And the trouble is that once you do that, inevitably the process goes both ways. You think you're using the criminals, but how far are the criminals infecting and using you? And when, given that Russia is already a kleptocracy, already a country with a serious problem of corruption at the top of the system, at what point do basically you do see Russia becoming that mafia state? That's it for this episode of Deep Dive. I'd like to thank Mark Galliotti for speaking to us. Mark's paper for the GI is called Time of Troubles, the Russian Underworld Since the Ukraine Invasion. There is a link to that in the podcast notes, along with several other papers from the GI's investigations into the region. You'll also find an extensive list of relevant research material used for this episode. For more research into organised crime from around the world, head over to our website, globalinitiative.net. This has been Deep Dive from the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organised Crime. I'm Jack Meekin-Vickers. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.